substantial leap of faith when you're coming to a company and being that they were a key competitor, I wasn't privy to some of the, the information that I needed to make a really good decision. Growing up, my father always told me that if you associate with the right people, you can't help but succeed. You could tell that these people were really, really, really smart. Young, but really, really smart. I was standing there with everybody else, but I didn't have a clue. I hadn't read a spec. I'd never spoken to anyone. I just signed the offer letter. So I wanted to get on board with this uh, company who seemed to have you know, an amazing talent pool. My personal opinion is that here in Silicon Valley, most civilians are amateurs. Yeah, I didn't know at the time that they didn't have working parts. No one could tell me anything. I mean, Scott Feller as well, I'd like to tell you, but I can't tell you. And it was all smoke and mirrors. We really didn't have a product. I knew they'd do good things. No matter what they picked, I knew they'd do something special. I started looking at the pedigrees of the people involved. It's, it's the people. You know, that's what makes this company so amazing and such a long-term win. They were gambling this risk, and I thought, that's not a bad train to jump on. The individual chips come from what we call a wafer, and the wafer is sliced from a single crystal of silicon. If you have a really good seed crystal, you'll grow a really good company. Knowing that you have someone who has all the experience of making companies be successful in Gordon Campbell, it was a no-brainer. One of the most interesting things about companies now is you actually can have direct contact with your customers over the internet. Trolley was one of the early SGI uh, employees and you know, acknowledged 3D guru in the industry. Gary Trolley is a little bit older and really smart. One of the guys sent me mail and his signature was, you know, so, 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 um, I own a 3DFX, I don't have a life. So I sent him back mail saying, Gary Taroli, I designed 3DFX stuff, I don't have a life either. <laughs> the unique thing that we had, I think, as three founders was ultimate trust in each of our abilities to do what was required. Smith was uh, very knowledgeable in the market and, and customer area uh, and really understood, you know, what the technology had accomplished and where it was headed. He would always run into the most, uh, you know, subtle computer errors that would just totally frustrate him. I've got a 120-page business plan, and now my machine crashes, it won't load it. I'm pretty good in technology, so they would come to me with ideas and say, this doesn't make any sense. And they're also pretty good in business, uh, and so I would say, we could try this, and they go, oh, you're crazy, that'll never work. We're living the dream of starting a company and, and having it be extremely successful, um, producing products that customers you know, write in and say, you've changed my life. I mean, that is extremely satisfying to all of us. Sellers, although he was a little bit young, uh, was, you know, really polished and, and very knowledgeable, uh, particularly for a guy his age. He's a big, tall, blonde kid, and she's really nice, too. It really is just amazing to be part of it, to be part of a team that we've hired that, you know, has extremely smart people, um, everyone working together um, towards common goals. Because there's two things in our sector, I guess, the people who had a technology vision and the people who, were, who, who, who saw business opportunity and capitalized on it. I was in the aerospace business. And one day, one of my clients, which was MIPS Computers, which built the RISC computing chips that were in Silicon Graphics workstations, they offered me a job to quit consulting and come on board there. Well, MIPS ultimately was acquired by Silicon Graphics. And at Silicon Graphics, I uh, met a guy there who shared my passion for the fact that the PC was going to emerge as this new platform for 3D graphics. And he introduced me to Gary and to Scott. They were in the process of spinning off a company from Silicon Graphics called Pellucid. Pellucid was founded on the notion of taking 3D graphics from SGI-style graphics down to the from the workstation down to the PC. Midway through our, our experience at Pellucid, which ultimately was acquired by a company called Media Vision that built sound cards and care less about 3D graphics, um, this crazy guy came in from this video game company. His name was John Passer. And this guy said, um, have you guys ever thought about doing a product for video games? And we said, why would we do that? We're in the design market. We, we build serious computer graphics. And Media Vision really wanted us to focus on very mainstream 2D Windows accelerators. I kept this passion for 3D to the point where the president of MediaVision finally told me, Ross, 
If you don't quit talking about 3D, I'm going to chop off your hand. <laughs> it seemed like I had limited career options there. I think Ross was the first to leave. Or were you the first to leave? I was the first to leave. And so Herb and I go to this picture. We have no idea what this is all about. And we'd always been, you know, used to SIGGRAPH and COMDEX, and now we're in this coin-op show, and very, very bizarre. And this was the trade show where Sega was launching Virtua Fighter. And we're looking at, like, you know, the kinds of 3D they were doing and thought, hey, we can do this. My wife said, just, you guys just stop talking and go do it. So meanwhile, you know, we're out pitching all these other people about funding this 3D graphics company and doing consulting work on the side and all this stuff. And uh, meet this guy, Gordy Campbell. Well, I was actually about a year into Tech Farm, and Tech Farm specializes in working with new startups. Tech Farm was about as small as we were at the yeah. time. I mean, they were sharing office with this networking company called The Land Guys. I mean, they were a hoopty company just like we were. You know. I was interviewing a marketing candidate for another company called Exponential, and the marketing candidate was Ross Smith. Ross was sort of not too excited during the interview. And I guess I was saying all the right words, but he could tell that I didn't have a passion for going out and trying to sell microprocessors. He just didn't have his heart in it. And Gordy at the end asked him, what does he really wanted to do? And Ross told him. So I called Scott, and I called Gary, and Gary lives in Boston. And meanwhile, he and, he and Scott had been working on the chip simulator. So I said, hey, I've got this opportunity. You know, we might be able to get funded through this guy I just met Gordy Campbell. And so I goes, you know, Stop what you're doing and let's, let's try and do a demo. We were extremely impressed with Gordy. He had all sorts of connections and, and wonderful ideas. They had gotten far enough along in the design where we could actually simulate what the chip would do, and we could make what we call movie loops, which is not a real-time rendering. It's, it's a, it's a time-based rendering of what we thought the, the images would be from the chip. After a couple meetings, we decided that we would actually try and put a company together. And so that was kind of the beginning of the quest for money. So literally five months went by. We're all working out of like, you know, my house basically in, in Palo Alto. We have, you know, all these computers all over the place and printers. You know, we'd gone out and rented a bunch of stuff to put together this whole business plan. SGI workstations and Macintoshes and PCs all strung around. My roommates were going crazy. I flew back several times back to Boston and Caroline, Gary's wife, would feed us and it was a wonderful place to work. And, and suddenly it was Thursday and Gary said, we are going outside today. I said, what? He said, we haven't gone outside all week. <laughs> it took six months of working back and forth with Ross to get the, the business plan to where it made any sense. First, we're going to build PCs for the arcade market and use this technology to do it. And then we're going to build motherboards with this technology on it. And Ross, for literally months and months, had had this um, error in a formula in his Excel worksheet. And suddenly, you know, what seemed to be a healthy business turned out to be a disaster. We took the business plan out at that time and showed it to the, uh, the investment bankers. Within 30 days after we started pitching, we were funded. And they loved it. And every round of financing we did after that, and we did three, was a complete sellout. At that point, we'd been together for almost a year, and we had been promising people hardware around the summer of 1995. And of course, as usual schedules go, we were a little bit late with the hardware. And now we didn't have any chips then. We didn't have boards. We had nothing. We ran around to everyone with these movie loops, <laughs> where we actually, the simulator made a movie. And we would show these movies and go, this is what our chip does. Now, this isn't real. But when it is real, this is what our chip will do. And no one believed it. Andy showed me a demo which I thought was the real thing, and they didn't really mention that they didn't have a product yet. <laughs> as resourceful as Ross always is, he came up with the idea that, um, well, you know, we're basically implementing technology very similar to what SGI did on a very high-end graphics subsystem, which at the time was a reality engine. So why don't we go out and, and buy a reality engine and show what our technology is going to look like? One of the things that we knew coming into this, and this was from our SGI experience, uh, was that demos are really important. That you can talk about megapixels per second, triangles per second, but especially in our field of endeavor, unless you've got some demos that show people what all this means, they don't get it and they don't believe you. And you know what comes up in all these meetings with these Japanese folks uh, is what about the fighting the game? And so we had these two characters. There was Anubis and then Nefertiti, Egyptian kind of themed. 
And we had already signed up Fujitsu and Orchid to sell our products, even though we didn't have any products to sell. And um, talked Orchid into letting us put the Reality Engine in their booth at Comdex behind a wall. People would look at it and they'd say, well, isn't that what it looks like when you run it on the Silicon Graphics Reality Engine? We said, yeah. And they said, well, and you're going to have a chip that'll do that? And we said, yeah. And they said, right. Diamond Multimedia was right behind us showing their first product based on NVIDIA, which was terrible. And they had this clunky looking stuff. And we've got this cool texture map reality engine thing. And they were so pissed off. And Steven Johnson, who's from Diamond, always used to, he used to come into our booth and he'd scream at the top of his lungs, that's not a chip. <laughs> <laughs> we were selling for months on end with nothing. I mean, with a piece of paper. Meanwhile, we'd gotten chips in. You know Gary and Scott and how talented they are, so um, kind of had a good feeling about it, but you never really know until these things come back what it, what it really does. This is on Super Bowl Sunday, and I don't even remember who was in the damn Super Bowl that year. You build a chip, and it may come back, and it may be perfect, but it usually takes us days or even weeks. They made a couple of fixes to some software, got this new chip in, hit return, and presto, up came the SGI flight simulator, just like it works on a reality engine. We ran it, and it just worked, and it was running, you know, absolutely phenomenal rates. That was the moment of truth. And we had this thing running, and it was like, you know, we are going to pull this thing off. We invited the um, representative from Microsoft to come see the hardware just weeks after we brought it up. All of us are very nervous because this is Microsoft standing in front of our new product. We showed him these kind of stupid demos, which is like tunnel and twist, and he didn't say anything. And now, I mean, your mouth is dry, you're just dying. And finally, finally he looked and he said to someone, he turned and he said, you know, you've just leapfrogged an entire industry. So then what happened is, is that he invited us to be the principal demo um, for Bill Gates' opening speech at um, WinHack. So here on this giant 60-foot screen is Bill Gates playing Valley of Raw. We were showing stuff that people ju could just not believe. People were looking under the table for the, for the SDI machine. They couldn't believe they it. They were looking for the fat table. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bill was watching it so intensely that he lost track of where he was during his talk. We actually had, you know, our competitors over there, you know, an inch from the screen staring at this thing, just sweating, yeah. literally, not knowing yeah. what in the world to say about it. And here are all these guys that, you know, we had told, we're going to build this, and it's going to work, and it's going to do this. And they all said, you can't do that. No one can do that. And there he was playing it. You know, when we first started, we didn't have any money. We were spending all this money on workstations and tools and everything for the engineers. And so we were looking for space and it found this building over by the Sunnyvale Golf Course. When we first started, I remember pulling up and it just reminded me of like an old motel. It's just a giant trailer. We had mice. The electricity was all done by non-union or probably even non-knowledgeable people. Cables running all over the place. 30 feet of Ethernet cable down the hall to a hub because we didn't have any wiring through the ceiling. Extra software and hardware at the time were down in this warehouse, and it was literally a warehouse. And had no windows, and we called that the dungeon. There were big garage doors that opened up, and half of the summer we would have them open because the air conditioner never worked. The birds would just fly in through the building, you know, wreaking havoc. We had a little family of birds that lived on top of the alarm bell. There was a camp that wanted to kill the birds, and there was a camp that said, no way. With the help of uh, Ross and Alma, we put up a birdhouse. The desks weighed about a thousand pounds each. For almost probably a year, you know, people were actually using these abandoned pieces of furniture that we found them randomly on the porch. And I think that if there was a nuclear war, you'd be very safe under one of these desks. It was truly a wonderful building. It was out overlooking the eighth hole of the uh, Sunnyvale Public Golf Course. People would be uh, designing and golf balls would bounce into the window. One of the engineers had this big bucket to collect the balls, so we collected over 100 golf balls in, uh, in buckets. Nobody ever got hurt. We spent 
you know, basically 24/7 at the office. We were, you know, we get up, we go to the office. You know, we got tired, we go home, go to sleep, and wake up and come back to the office. I interviewed when I went over there, and I saw mattresses in uh, one of the uh, hallways, and uh, some of the software guys uh, that spent 24, 48 hours working straight, taking some naps. I remember one night I drove home about four in the morning and uh, woke up in a ditch by the side of the freeway. I just fell asleep and drove off. Brian Hook, one of the early engineers, he was one of the ones that, yeah, they used to consume mass quantities of Coca-Cola. So I remember one day him calling up like one of our administrators, we're out of soda, right? And so, okay, I'll like run down to like Lucky's and get a couple six packs. And Brian would go like, no, you don't understand. We need a pallet of soda. <laughs> After Helen came on board, she didn't realize that we were all adamant about the beer that we drink. We have a lot of beer drinkers. So she tried to go out and like just buy Bud Light and there was this big revolt. <laughs> you can't buy Bud Light, we need micro brewed beer. Dave Bowman has a unique uh, paging system. Dave used to be all the way across the building. This is a relatively small building. But off in the distance, about every 10 minutes, I'd hear, Melissa! Kristen Montgomery had been, she might as well just have purchased a home in Japan um, her first six months of the company. Kristen got to go to Japan many times with Ross. <laughs> Lugging a huge machine and going through the subway the whole time. Kristen was the mule. <laughs> I was the mule. <laughs> so Gary and myself and a bunch of people who were in Hudson, Massachusetts were sitting listening to Ross. The same stuff that we're selling to the Air Force today, Diamond will be selling to consumers, you know, next Christmas. <laughs> this guy is amazing. He could sell a sack of dog crap as gold to somebody. Andy Keene kept looking out there and he didn't have confidence that, that there were orders there. And I called my contact aside and I said, look, we will give you this product for free for six months. No cost to you, for free. And they said no. He would forecast really, really low. We're in big <laughs> trouble. <laughs> because this is the proverbial, I could not give my product away. When I went to the game developers to start with, and they're like, okay, how many units have you sold? None. You know, how many partners do you have? One, maybe two, you know. I heard people rumbling about these orders, but not not knowing where these orders were. We had taken a strategy where we were approaching OEMs, like PC, or PC OEMs, Gateway, Compaq. I collected all these pieces of paper off of people's desks and files, etc., and put it all down on one piece of paper, and we developed what was known as, or is known as a backlog, and it was one page. And every time we got an order from that point on, we had this bell, and we'd ring the bell. It's amazing how fast the success of a company can change. This is our backlog today. I think the intent for 3DFX was to put out the best price performance and features available in the market and that's exactly what they've done. They've been about six to nine months ahead of anybody technologically. Just now our competitors are catching up with the level of performance of our first chipset and now we're about to release this new chipset, the Voodoo 2 chipset, and it's about three times as fast as the original Voodoo chipset, which puts it you know, miles and miles ahead of, of anything else that's going to be on the market. We were doing tests with a very popular game called uh, GL Quake, and it was running at 120 frames per second, um, which is just silly. I mean, nobody's going to run a game at, uh, at that kind of frame rate or want to, but what it illustrates is the headroom that's available for developers. And one of the things that we're trying to do is now start working with the game developers and publishers further in advance than we've done in the past to start emulating to some extent what Sony, Nintendo, and Sega have done to be able to tell them what our roadmap is far enough out so that they can start creating content that's original and directed towards our technology from the very beginning. So instead of just being a technology leader or a hardware leader, we want to be a development leader and really advance the whole field of 3D graphics, especially in gaming. We get a lot of feedback from the developers, so we're always pushing the envelope in terms of what they want. That's a big task for somebody in our business because in the past, literally, the first time somebody would find out about a new technology in the acceleration business was the day it was launched into the retail market or into the OEM market. We've really seen ourselves as a consumer electronics company from day one. So we've spent a lot of money and a lot of, of uh, effort on branding and getting the 3D effects name out there. If you can run a lot of different games better, noticeably better games that don't run on anyone else's hardware, you've got a distinct value add, and because of that, the consumer can know that. 
and so that's what you try to build your brand on. A good example is Intel Inside. Um, now that's an amb ambitious example because what Intel used to accomplish that was $300 million and you know, we're just doing it with hardworking people and very, very good technology. The most important thing is that Voodoo Graphics is now considered the baseline in the development community. So we're no longer looking at low performance 3D cards as being the lowest common denominator. You're looking at Voodoo Graphics being the lowest common denominator. And so game developers are able to bring their content and their artwork and everything else up to a, a very high standard. And then they can enhance on top of that for Voodoo 2. Everyone here is, is, is absolute really a perfectionist and a striver for, you know, generating products that the end consumers absolutely fall in love with. They love 3D effects. How do I get a 3D effects board? How do I get a Voodoo graphics card? And, you know, you read this stuff sometimes and you wonder, God, do these people have lives? I mean, this must be all they do. But then you start looking at where these emails are coming from, like so Slovenia, Turkey, uh, deep in the heart of, of, you know, Africa. And some of these people don't have lives. We, we are their lives. You know, we're in a way really competing against Hollywood, which, you know, we're doing it in real time. And, and a few short years ago, that was absolutely impossible to even to think about. To my mom's eye, it, anything that makes it look more like TV, that's what she's impressed with. We know that we're nowhere near uh, how far we can go. Right now we're dealing with low polygon models, right? The monsters in Quake are still a you thousand know, polygons. What happens when all of a sudden you get real life characters that are running around these games? We reached really far out and, and happened to, you know, deliver it in a cost effective manner. And that's, you know, been allowed us to sustain ourselves over time. The coolest thing was actually being able to deliver and, and kind of tell everyone who poo pooed us in the beginning, say, you know, here, well, here it is. I told you so. You know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'm personally kind of uh, relieved at the growth just simply because I get to sleep nights, see my kids. We've been to, you know, weddings and we've been to funerals and we've been to, of, of all the people. So it's kind of been a, a real experience and not only did our product grow and the technology, but also, you know, just um, the people who first started the company. I want to see this happen. You know, I mean, it's almost like you know, reading a thriller novel or something like that where you just, you want to see how this all ends up. Gordy thought it would be, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars because he had found a chip in technology and knew what uh, a rocket things could be. And I, I would have been, I would have settled for much, much less. Uh, like, I would be happy like 10 or 20 million dollars after like five years. And I uh, still can't believe we sell you know, as much as we do. And I'm glad we had someone like Gordy who really knew it could be big. When Voodoo 2 hits the, hits the streets, it's going to, I mean, it's not even funny. It's going to ruin a lot of people. Um, you know, it's basically, you know, everyone here is still kicking ass and taking names. And I don't, I don't see that changing for a long time. People said, no one will ever buy a 3D-only graphics board. Well, a million people have bought that. Uh, you can't create this level of realism for $49. Well, we've done it. I love doing things that people say can't be done. What do you want to be when you grow up is like the founder of a company that's successful. So this, this is it, sort of, we're, we're grown up now. I don't feel I'm grown up. I get paid to wear shorts and uh, play games and uh, invent technology. I think that's the greatest job in the world. <laughs>